Good morning, everyone. So my name is Cristina Dias, Marrocas Dias. I'm a chemist, a professor in the chemistry department. So I'm a bit of an intruder here among all these artists. Uh, but I think this is one of the most interesting things in our work in uh, Reolos is that we can combine actually art, sciences, and, uh, and this is, a, I can think it's a, a very interesting uh, uh, thing. So we start uh, with our first speaker. Uh, this is Jessica Hallett. I'm going to give a, a brief overview about Jessica. Jessica uh, received her doctorate in Islamic art and archaeology from Oxford University. And she is a curator of the early modern Middle East of uh, the Kalushko Gulbenkian Museum. And also a researcher of CHAM, which is a research center from um, Evra, uh, no, sorry, uh, Lisbon New University, New University of Lisbon. She has been working in Portugal for several years, uh, always in topics dealing with the crossing between Islamic and European art. Uh, actually, we met, I met uh, Jessica uh, during the exhibition The Oriental Carpet in Portugal, which was held in uh, 2007 in the National Museum of Ancient Arts, and obviously our interaction was because of the Islamic influences in the Arreolos tapestries. So uh, she's going to be talking today about carpets from the Islamic world and innovation in production and design. And I thank Jessica for being with us today. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. It's uh, wonderful to be here with you. Um, I would love to be in Ariolush, um, but unfortunately it wasn't possible for me to go there. It's one of my favorite places, the Alentejo. And of course, for a long time, I came to Portugal in 1995. So for a long time, I have followed what has been happening in the town and very delighted to see um, the development of this project, Ponto. Anyway, I'd like to thank um, the mayor of Ariolush, the director regional de cultura do Alentejo, uh, the president of the University of Evra, of course, Christina Baraka Dias, and also Philippe uh, Rocha da Silva. Now, I am going to focus today on Islamic carpets and not on Ariolush. I want to use it as a case study for looking at innovation, uh, especially as Ri Lobo will be speaking uh, with all of his in depth knowledge about Ariolush um, later, later today. So, time for the glasses, time to share. Uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, let's hope this all works. Um, and uh, let's get going. So let's need to put this on on show. Everybody can see that? Yeah? Okay. So Palace or Tent, Carpets from the Islamic World and Innovation in Production and Design. So nearly uh, 40 years ago, John Thompson, who you can see here, published his seminal work, Carpets from the Tents, Cottages and Workshops of Asia, in which he attempted to shift the paradigm of carpet studies away from categories around origin to the context of making, creating an entirely new way of looking at carpets. Previously, carpets from the Islamic world have been classified mainly uh, by dealers and antiquarians according to their geography. I'm sure you're all familiar with names like Tabriz, Isfahan, Anatolia, Caucasus, etc., which created confusion as so many dissimilar types were and continue to be made in any one place. And modern political boundaries often do not uh, reflect more important historical or cultural landscapes. Instead, he proposed four main categories according to the circumstances in which these objects were or are made. Tribal or tribal style domestic weavings, products of cottage industries, carpets manufactured in towns or city workshops, and court carpets. While his hierarchy placed carpets according to technical achievement from simple to complex, his study revealed that artistic innovation occurred at each end. Today I'm going to return to Thompson's work a year after his untimely death to look closely at these processes to better understand how we can preserve, defend, and or renew 
the role of traditional textile producing centers. I'm going to focus on historical examples, mainly from the Kaluskobenkian Foundation or museum or from his book uh, to bring to life the lessons that history can teach us. Knotted pile carpets have long been admired for their color, texture, pattern, durability, and warmth. Woven traditionally in sheep rearing regions across Asia and North Africa in both mountain and desert areas, the first carpets were probably made to imitate the texture and insulating properties of animal pelts. The well-preserved Pazrit carpet on the left excavated in Siberia dates from the fourth century BC and is very similar to carpets woven in the Islamic world today. The knotted pile structure consists of warp, weft and pile, and two processes are combined, weaving and knotting. The remarkable continuity and persistence of knotted pile production over nearly 3000 years reflects the versatility of the technique, as well as the unique place held by the carpet as the primary furnishing and furniture of urban, rural and nomadic living quarters. It is far more than a floor covering in the occidental sense, for this single item may serve diverse functions, from tables, chairs and beds, to curtains, cupboards and shrouds. Indeed, the physical world of Islam was once a veritable draped universe of textiles and carpets, which only not only uh, embellished architecture, uh, the floors, walls, doors and windows, uh, but also created it. The classical Muslim prayer carpet you can see on the right, not only delimits space, but also constructs it, and in every sense is portable architecture, providing all the conditions of ritual uh, prayer offered in a mosque, wherever it is placed. Now, Thompson was among the first scholars to propose that carpets should be studied and identified according to four characteristics, their fibers, colors, woven structure, and design. And I'm not going to pass uh, too much time here just to remind you that typically they're made of wool, silk, or cotton, spinning and dyeing are involved, um, different types of looms from the vertical to the horizontal, different times of knot, the symmetrical, uh, which creates a gridded texture in contrast to the asymmetrical knot, which allows for curving lines. And then of course, the importance of the knot count. And you can see on the left, how it's very easy to create octagons, but very difficult to create curves with a low knot count. But when you go up to 3000 knots per decimeter, you can begin uh, to make curved uh, lines. Now, the simple pointillist technique of knotted pile carpets can be used to execute practically any design in any number of colors in any size, very much like areolo stitched carpets. However, as the points of, car of color of a carpet pattern are built in horizontal rows, one at a time, the pattern must be pre-planned. Uh, in spite of the myriad effects possible in carpets, the field patterns are usually organized in one of three basic layouts, framed by a border, uh, the all over repeat on the left, the centralized design in the middle, and the pictorial asymmetrical carpet on the right. As Thompson emphasized more than 40 years ago, but sadly is something that we still need to repeat today because merchants especially insist on mystifying imperfections, it's important not to do that. They almost always reflect honest mistakes and the pressures of time. And um, these irregularities, inconsistencies and asymmetries can tell us how close the carpet is to the original conception of its maker or of the drawing of the designer. And that's the level of innovation, which is what I want to concentrate on today. So I just bring to your attention, differences in color, differences in pattern of the field in the center and differences in the corner design um, on um, the right.
Thompson defined um, tribal or tribal style domestic weavings as those that are made primarily for use and not for sale, thus avoiding market preference pressures and uniformity. And as you'll see in most tribal weavings, they have a trapezoidal and not purely a rectangular shape. They're not designed as such, but they're woven directly from memory. The tribal weaver learns a fairly large number of small patterns and then uses them in a variety of combinations and colors. It is a mistake, however, to think that a simple design is necessarily simple minded. Considerable skill is required to disguise the repeating nature of these patterns, especially as mathematicians of transformation geometry have shown that only 17 classes of all over repeat uh, patterns exist, as you can see here. Thus, the weaver's talent and skill is reflected in the challenge that she creates to the viewer to dissecting these basic components of the design. Alteration of color can distract the eye from the mechanical repetition of a single motif, or a lattice grid can be used to form a network of spaces um, in which, um, uh, which are embellished with different colors and motifs to create complexity. And I think that you wouldn't necessarily guess at first eyesight that these carpets have such simple patterns uh, behind them. And here you can see, I mean, a brilliant example of a tribal carpet, a teke carpet, and how it's low in uniformity. You can see its trapezoidal shape, but very high in creativity. Imagine that small tesserae of design is used to create the field of the carpet, but it's the expert use of color, as you can see here, and the introduction of small motifs which reflect the weaver's life that bring um, its um, it bring about its originality and you can see in the border how she is inventing uh, motifs between fairly standard ones and this is what brings dynamism and innovation to her design Thompson enjoyed comparisons with music, associating these, parents, these patterns to folk songs daughters learnt from their mothers, which are not written down but kept alive through direct transmission from one person to another. These tunes or patterns resemble in a general way those of the community or the tribal group, while retaining a distinct and individual character, which is why every techie carpet is different. The repertoire is also never static, with new things being absorbed and others forgotten over time. The tribal tradition is maintained exclusively by women, who in addition to decorating the surface of their carpets with devices to promote good fortune, fertility and ward off evil, invent motifs to reflect their own story, their narrative and their personal identity. Here is an extremely invented de design created by the, re the repetition of asymmetric uh, pair of snakes, presumably to ward off evil. Expressive power is achieved through the composition of space in the combination of inversion, repetition and rhythm of the pattern and in the color harmony. The primal abstraction and profound character of some tribal weavings resemble those of abstract paintings. And I make in a comparison here with a beautiful painting by Mark Rothko, number 46 from 1957. At the other end of the spectrum, we have court carpets. Here, production is split into specialized crafts from the purchase of raw materials to sorting, carding, combing, spinning, plying, dyeing, designing, cartoon making, weaving, clipping, and washing. Specialization allows each craft to be developed at a higher level than is possible for tribal weavers who do everything themselves apart from the dyeing. As you might have noticed in my earlier images, we saw a man dyeing, and dyeing is one of the few um, tasks that is exclusively a male endeavor. Specialization um, allows each craft to, sorry, it also brings uniformity to the, the, uh, to the finished article, and we can see here the development of a perfect rectangle. The workshop carpet is woven from a cartoon, thus the art of the carpet is the art of the designer, usually a painter. In Iran, in the early 16th century, a design revolution occurred. And in addition to overall repeat patterns that you can see in the painting on the left, 
centralized design suddenly appeared, as you can see on the right, distinguished by a principal central motif, usually a medallion. This layout evolved from uh, Islamic court art, uh, especially the art of the book, where the medallion lent itself beautifully to book binding and manuscript elimination, as we can see here. Centralized layouts, in comparison, are the most demanding uh, to weave because they require a huge uh, quarter plan in comparison to the small tesserae that we were looking at in the tribal carpet. It has long been assumed that the designers supplied the weavers with drawings on squared paper in which one colored square on the plan corresponded to one knot on the carpet as used by weavers today. However, this method is, uh, is more recent, much more recent, as John Thompson has clearly demonstrated. And this is extremely interesting. The field uh, design of this spectacular silk carpet in Coimbra appears to have fourfold symmetry. But if we look more closely, it's immediately apparent that the top and bottom halves are not identical. The pendant at the top is larger, for example, and the large blossoms nearby are white and not yellow as they are in the bottom. Irregularities of this kind indicate that the weavers could not have been counting knots one by one on a colored uh, plan, as this would have resulted in a perfect carpet. Instead, they appear to be using a drawing as their a guide, and they are actually interpreting it. So the large differences that we see between top and bottom are the result of the bottom having been rolled away. So the weavers are no longer able to look at the bottom of the carpet to know exactly what to do at the top. And this is so interesting because part of what makes this carpet so magnificent to uh, enjoy to the eye is because it appears at first glance to be perfect, but these aspects are what give it life. The asymmetry gives it energy and boldness. In practice, knotting a carpet design accurately from a drawing, as you can see here, imagine taking a painting like that and putting it knot by knot onto the loom requires a very high level of skill. And in many ways, the introduction of squared paper has reduced the interpretive uh, scope of the weaver and in many ways dulling the final uh, result. And here you can see a spectacular carpet in the Gulbenkian and where it looks to be perfectly symmetrical, but when you look more closely, all those animals are unique. Uh, this is actually really a pictorial carpet and the border as well. The birds appear to be similar, but each one is slightly different. Now, um, in contrast to the tribal, the tribal carpet, um, John Thompson regarded the court carpet to resemble a concerto or an Arab makam. Similarly, the, um, the court carpet uh, created by a composer um, uh, 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 is created by a composer and weavers use their expert skills and training to convert the score not by not into a finished carpet. And I think you'll agree that this ex corporate carpet is, is like music. It's like the Kandinsky that I put on the right. You can see how the variation in colors, the dynamism of the design, it's bringing movement and sound to our eyes. So, what have we learned then? That basically the corpus of ideas and patterns constituting the tribal and folk tradition has acted as a sort of prime substance for the periodic development of court carpets. Many of the basic ideas and forms of court carpets derive from earlier traditional forms. I think it's quite clear here how the field of this court carpet is resonating with the tribal design that came before it. The movement of ideas in the opposite direction is more obvious. Designs emanating from court workshops had a powerful and sustained influence on the patterns woven in cottage industries and were even taken up by less isolated tribes. And you can see how even when it comes to the tribal weaver in Kerman on the right, able to bring something dynamic um, to the design. So from these uh, two extremes of production of the court and tribal levels, designs filter down and up 
um, through towns, villages, and rural areas, um, where those weavers uh, attempt, because of market forces, to make something up to date, fashionable, and sellable. And even in the late 19th century in the Caucasus to make something really very original. Um, and these are very uh, special carpets from the Gulbenkian collection. Here, cottage weavers have become very inventive and created a whole new repertoire of designs using elements of traditional patterns coming from um, tribal production and also bringing uh, down from the court um, organization um, to uh, rework them in a very original um, way. Since then, um, there has been a lamentable, as you know, decline in carpet to production for three reasons. The first is the introduction of synthetic dye around 1900, which fortunately is already being reversed in the Middle East in many parts. Technology industrialization and new farming methods have had a corrosive effect on rural and tribal communities, especially. And that means that we are not necessarily seeing the same um, down up um, responses as, as was occurring historically. And export, adapting to markets which do not appreciate the time and investment that goes into good designs and good weaving, and perhaps not understanding how sometimes asymmetry can really be the sign of an excellent piece of weaving. In this respect, I believe, and I'm just going to conclude now, that Thompson's work offers four key um, lessons. So visual patterns like ideas and musical melodies have no real frontiers. Innovation occurs in a constant flow, he describes, towards and away from these two poles of influence up and down, court and tribal. Thus the line delineated in 19th century Europe between art and craft, between the court and the nomad, between the palace and the tent needs to be blurred and even abandoned. And in this respect, I would just like to remind you that it was not like this in the Renaissance, quite to the contrary. If we look at Lorenzo de Medici's inventory of 1492, a small table carpet like the one on the right <laughs> was worth twice a Donatello sculpture or three times one of these Balieri paintings, which you can see in Florence, Paris, or London. So in the Renaissance, it was understood that a carpet and also other textiles like tapestries, they were valued uh, monetarily. And that happened even in Portugal until the 1950s. And I think you'll find this rather amazing that the director of the museum chose at that time to hang a carpet in direct juxtaposition with um, the famous uh, painting by Hieronymus Bosch of the temptation of St. Anthony. Therefore, um, breaking and blurring the line between craft and art. And then, um, secondly, who is the artist? In this carpet, it is signed by a man, but all our research shows that it was made by a woman. The man is merely the merchant. The artist and maker is a woman. And in the end, um, if we uh, want to um, de preserve, defend, and renew traditional carpet producing centers, we need to focus on the empowerment of women. Thirdly, in terms of innovation, for centuries women have been using textiles and embroideries, especially I'm working, you can come and see my exhibition in the Gulbenkian on this, which opens on the 24th, uh, and carpets for personal, artistic, and even political expression to gain some control over uh, under otherwise oppressive social uh, structures. And it is the personal story, as we have seen in the tribal carpets, that makes them um, so unique. Following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, tribal women re weavers resisted uh, their condition and began interpreting the circumstances and politics of war and conflict in the region, drastically altering the content of their carpets to incorporate the apparatus of war into their designs and thereby uh, taking control of it. Tanks replaced flowers, rocket launches predict. Uh, replaced vases, airplanes repl uh, replaced abstract borders to make extremely uh, powerful uh, carpets. 
Since the withdrawal of the um, USSR, the same themes and subjects have been reused and remade each time conflict has invaded their homes. This is a production that occurs specifically in moments of crisis. Uh, most recently, since uh, 2015, drones have appeared as a subject matter, and you can see how they're taking their traditional, that tesserae motif, and developing it um, with a drone uh, motif. So finally, as um, the simple uh, pointless technique of nodded pile carpets can be used to execute practically any design in any number of colors in any size, and it's possible to translate more or less any design to a knotted pile carpet, designers today should take up the challenge and follow the footsteps uh, to a long line of designs before them, applying themselves to making modern design suitable for such a time-honored and enduring technique. And I leave you with um, this, the latest work of Baku artist Faig Ahmed, who contemplates how age old structures can be disrupted, overturned or reorganized. His hand woven carpet entitled Watama from the name of the Buddha, enlightened or awakened one, appears to fray, swirl and ooze right in front of the viewer. A helpful reminder that long lasting traditions or established systems can shape shift at any time. Everything seems in flux and at the same time we see new horizons and fresh expressive possibilities materialize right before our eyes. Thank you. Muito obrigada.